Welcome everybody to our virtual voyage through the universe. My name is Jose. I'm going to be your host joining you from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in Denver, Colorado. We hope you're having a good day so far. and Thank you for joining us this morning. Before we get started, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science would like to acknowledge that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations and peoples. We would also like to acknowledge that the state of Colorado includes the traditional and ancestral lands of 48 tribal nations, which are now spread across the American Southwest, the Great Plains, and the Rocky Mountain region. Now, in our virtual voyage through the universe, we are going to be joined by one of our curators and scientists, an astronomer who works here, Dr. Kuchun Yu, who knows so much about space and is going to be sharing some wonderful things with you today. There's my good friend, Dr. Kuchun Yu. Is it okay that I call you my good friend? Oh, of course, definitely. Okay. You are my good friend. <laughs> All right, excellent. Now, as the program go goes on, uh, 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 Dr. Kuchun Yu is going to be sharing some things with you. Uh, if you have questions about what you're seeing, you can post those questions into the chat. We do have some organizations that are going to be joining us on camera a little later. If you are from one of those classrooms who's going to be joining us on camera, when it's your turn to ask the question, make sure you speak loudly and clearly. If you are joining us via the, if you are just uh, typing your questions into the chat, make sure you ask your question only once. I know those questions can be very burning sometimes and you want to get an answer to that question. But in order to answer that question, we have to be able to read it. And when all of the chats go so fast, I can't keep an eye on them. There's no way we're going to get to your question. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And we hope we have a lot of fun today in our tour. So I'm going to kick it off by asking you, Dr. Kachun, what does it mean to be an astronomer? Well, that's a great question, Jose. And uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning um, to everyone out there. Um, an astronomer is a scientist who studies the universe and the universe um, at least to astronomers, is everything off of planet Earth. And so it could be planets in our solar system, it could be the sun in our solar system, it could be the stars, um, of which our sun is just um, our closest star. Uh, it could be our galaxy, which is our collection of stars that make up um, where our sun um, lives. And it could be other galaxies. And uh, there are also astronomers called cosmologists who study the entire universe. So basically anything from uh, the outside of the Earth onto the edge of the universe is fair game for astronomers. And astronomers typically use telescopes um, to help them study the universe. So I think we have a couple pictures of telescopes. Um, here's a picture of a ground-based telescope. There's um, one on a tripod. There's also a bigger telescope that's used by professional astronomers in the dome off in the distance that you see towards the left in the background. But we've also put telescopes in space as well. And so uh, we should uh, see a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope that is orbiting in low Earth orbit. And so astronomers use telescopes as well as spacecraft that we send out to the planets. And all the data, all the information that have been collected by astronomers uh, for hundreds of years um, have been compiled and, um, and we'll be seeing um, some of that data in the visualization software that um, we are using uh, today. And so we're using a software called Uniview. Um, and you see that behind me. So uh, you, you can tell that we are in orbit around the Earth, um, attached to the International Space Station. And this is um, one of the powerful things about the software is that we can go anywhere and travel anywhere in, in space and in time in the universe, um, or at least anywhere that is built in the simulation. And so the software simulation runs in our planetarium. And if you ever get a chance, I encourage you to come to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science um, in person to see um, one of our shows um, where you might be able to interact and, um, and learn about the universe through our software. And so with that, I'm going to um, get started. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to have a poll. Um, and let's go ahead and bring up that poll. And um, we're going to ask um, you, which rocky or terrestrial planet, Earth-like planet, do you want to visit first? So do we want to go visit Mercury, Venus, Earth, or Mars? Go ahead All and... right, go ahead and uh, hop on that poll. If you're watching individually, you can uh, vote individually. If you are joining us from a classroom, I suggest getting a, a show of hands to see which one your class wants to vote for. We'll have this up for about 30 seconds. Getting lots of answers. Okay. 
Well, the poll was pretty exciting for a little while. Yeah, it was pretty split there for a little bit, but now we look like we're having a clear leader. We're going to take just a few more seconds before we close out the poll. All right, we're going to go ahead and show the results. It looks like we have a pretty clear winner at this point. All right, so uh, we're going to go to Mars. Let's uh, zoom out away from planet Earth. And what I'll do is I'll pull out entirely and see the rest of the solar system. And let me toggle on some orbit. So we mentioned um, in the poll, the four inner planets, we have Mercury closest to the sun, and then Venus, and then Earth, and then Mars. But um, clearly, the winner of the poll was Mars. So let's fly on down to Mars. And during all this time, I've been traveling much faster than the speed of light to travel around the solar system. So this is obviously something you can't do in real life, but it's something that we can do in our software simulation. So let's travel down to Mars, the often called the red um, planet. That's because if you see Mars in the sky, you actually um, notice that it's um, a different color than the other objects in the sky, most of which are stars. Um, so Mars does have kind of an orangish tint when you um, see it in the sky. And when we fly up to it, we see that it's um, kind of has an orangish, um, reddish um, color. And that's due to the land or the rock and dust on Mars. Mars um, doesn't have any bodies of water, uh, unlike Earth. Remember when we were flying over Earth, um, you might have um, seen uh, the blue of the oceans, but here on Mars, we only see um, surface rock. And um, so here is a picture of Mars um, taken from, um, I think, the Perseverance uh, rover. And so you can see lots of rock on the surface. And in between the rock is lots of sand and dust. And so there's um, so much dust on Mars that uh, Mars can uh, occasionally have dust storms. And so these storms, um, can cover a substantial fraction of the planet, uh, meaning it, um, the storms can um, get so thick that hardly any sunlight at all gets onto the surface. Let's uh, switch back to, um, this, yeah, to this view. And the other thing that you'll notice on Mars, um, what's, um, you, can, you can put post that in the chat, you'll see lots of little circular features and any guesses as to what these are. And I'll just give you a few seconds for anyone to respond. But um, these are craters. And so Mars is filled with um, craters that are caused by um, asteroids and comets smacking into the surface. And I see, yes, people are answering in the chat that um, they, they see craters as well. You see craters on top of craters. And so Mars has been peppered by craters over the last um, 3 billion years, 4 billion years of the solar system's history. And, um, we do see evidence of running water on Mars. And so you, you can even see, um, see these sort of straight lines kind of um, towards the middle of the screen. Um, those are channels that have been carved by running water, but water last ran on the surface of Mars billions of years ago. And since then, Mars has dried out. It lost most of its atmosphere. So uh, the atmosphere on Mars is under half a percent, the thickness of Earth's atmosphere. So it, um, the, the air is very thin. Um, you can't really breathe it, and most of it is carbon dioxide. So even though Mars is a place that we probably will be sending astronauts uh, to visit in coming decades, it's not um, a place where you can easily live. So with that, um, that is Mars. And I think we have a second poll where we can visit, uh, decide where we want to go for our next part of the tour. And so we're going to be uh, visiting either Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. So go ahead and answer the poll, and figure out our ne next destination. Where will it be? The gas giants and ice giants I've heard Neptune and Uranus referred to as. Uh, could you, maybe you could tell us why are they called ice giants? Yes, um, so um, when I was growing up, all these planets were known as gas giants. Uh, but um, now Jupiter and Saturn are called gas giants or gas planets. And well, actually all of them are gas planets. 
but Uranus and Neptune, as Jose said, are also um, known as ice giants. And that's because a good fraction of um, their makeup is in the form of ice or ices, and not just water ice, but ammonia and methane ice. Whereas, and it looks like we have a um, clear winner, Saturn with 50% of the uh, vote is our winner. So we're gonna be traveling to Saturn. All and, right, um, Saturn. And unlike uh, Uranus and Neptune, Jupiter and Saturn are actually mostly um, hydrogen and helium. And uh, so we're back at looking at the solar system and um, we have the orbit of Mars showing up as red. But if we zoom out, we'll see the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And so Saturn is the sixth planet from the sun. It's in that yellow orbit, or it has that yellow orbit. So let's go ahead and target Saturn and let's fly on down to it. And you can enter into the chat, but um, you might remember what Saturn's most famous feature is, and this is probably why people wanted to go to Saturn. And as we fly into Saturn, you'll notice um, we have a bunch of orbital lines coming on, and these are the orbit lines of the moons of Saturn. So Saturn has over 80 moons, and actually um, right now the moon count is 83, um, and it has three more moons than Jupiter. And every now and then you'll hear in the news that astronomers have found even more moons. And so um, 83 is probably not the final count for moons for Saturn. Whereas our Earth, our planet Earth, only has one moon. It's called the moon. And then, so here we are at Saturn. And let's, uh, let me pivot around. And yes, I see in the chat that people um, remember what makes Saturn um, really prominent, and those are its rings. And um, so here are Saturn's rings, and we'll continue tilting around. And even though the rings look like they're one um, or several solid objects, in fact, they're, um, they are composed of trillions and trillions of bits of ice. So long ago, hundreds of millions of years ago, Saturn probably um, had a moon, an icy moon in orbit, but it got too close to the planet. And so it broke up under Saturn's gravity. And it kept breaking up into smaller and smaller pieces. And those pieces spread out into the ring system that you see here. So even though um, the rings look solid, they're actually composed of lots of bits of ice um, and they range in, in size anywhere from microscopic to boulders in size. And they all orbit in, uh, around Saturn and they actually orbit along the Saturn's equator. And you can see how thin the rings are. And the sun is coming from the right. And um, so off to the left, yeah, it looks like there's a big chunk taken out of the rings, but that's um, actually due to Saturn's shadow being cast on the rings. So the rings are complete. You can see the shadows. And if you look closely, closely, you might even be able to see stars through the rings. So here is Saturn. And um, with that, I'm, um, I'm going to open up the, um, the chat and um, to um, the question. So, so Jose, um, can you um, help um, us figure out who is going to get to um, ask um, questions? I sure can. We are going to hear some questions from Miss Tun's class from Marina Vista Elementary School. So, uh, Miss Tun, if you'd like to have some of your uh, question questionnaires, I guess, <laughs> come up and speak loudly and clearly into the microphone, we can answer those questions for you. Go ahead and uh, unmute your microphone. Let's see if we can adjust that for you. There you go. Come on, guys. All right. Question the time. Line. Don't be shy. They're coming. Go ahead. All right. Right here and speak loudly. Hello. Big voice. Hello. How do you classify a star? And which star is the biggest star? How do you classify stars? So um, astronomers have multiple ways of classifying stars, but the simplest way is to classify by how big they are. And so it turns out that our sun is um, actually kind of a medium or average size star, um, even though it's the largest thing in our solar system, it's a hundred times wider um, in, in size than our earth. Uh, but there are stars that are far smaller than our sun in, in mass, only 1% or so of, of, of the mass or uh, 
yeah, just roughly 1% um, of the mass of our sun. And there are some stars that are up to 100 times or more uh, massive than our sun. So, uh, so we do know of very, very massive stars, but they lay very far away in our galaxy. So they're not close by or easy to see. Great question. All right. And I think we have another question from Ms. Tun's class. And feel free to give your name, too. Go ahead. Hi. I was wondering how the sun burns in space. OK, that's a, another great question. How does the, um, the sun burn in space? And uh, the sun um, generates energy. And that's um, why we see light and heat um, coming from the sun. And without the sun, life on Earth wouldn't exist because you need light and heat from the sun for plants to grow to keep um, our Earth warm. Um, but uh, the sun is composed of hydrogen and helium. And under immense pressures and temperatures at the center of the sun, that hydrogen undergoes a nuclear fusion process. So this is um, a way for, uh, to get energy out of that hydrogen gas, where the hydrogen turns into helium. But that can only occur under millions of degrees and under the intense pressures at the center of the sun. So uh, even though um, sometimes people call it burning, it's not um, quite like the same thing as um, setting something on fire um, like you would do uh, with burning that you um, are normally familiar with. But uh, the sun has energy through um, nuclear. Um, it has nuclear energy basically through a fusion process. Another terrific question. And so um, who, who are we um, talking to next, Jose? We're going to move on to uh, Ms. Kowaleski's class from Erie Middle School. All right. OK. They are coming up. All right. We've got, OK, so we've got, do we have time for two questions? Yeah, we'll start with two, and then we'll see how much time we got. Okay, we've just got two big ones. Okay, so we've got Lucy here and her friend Tatum. All right, shoot. Um, what happens if you get sucked into a black hole? <laughs> okay, that's um, a popular question. What happens if you get sucked into a black hole? And I think we even have a picture of a black hole. And um, black holes are, um, are the um, end stages of supermassive, uh, very massive stars, and they collapse. Um, into themselves and the gravity from black holes um, can be so strong at least when you get close to them that nothing can escape and not even light which is why they appear black and here you see an artist's conception of a black hole in, in orbit around a companion star and it's pulling in some of the atmosphere um, in, in into the black hole and it turns out it's not, actually not e that easy to get pulled into a black hole and what happens here is that the gas actually goes into orbit around the black hole, just like things can go into orbit around the sun or around the Earth. And it's only because that gas um, has friction um, with itself. It, um, the gas molecules rub against um, other gas molecules, and they lose energy, and they slowly spiral in. And, so you've, um, and because there's so much friction, you can actually see the gas glowing white hot. And so the black hole, or at least the region around the black hole, actually emits a lot of energy. You can see those jets shooting out. And that's just because um, uh, a lot of the gas actually gets um, energized by the friction as they orbit, and um, some of it gets shot out. And only a small fraction um, actually ends up falling into the black hole. So black holes aren't um, like vacuum cleaners in space. It, um, they're actually um, hard for stuff to fall in. And uh, if you are able to fall in, meaning you weren't just orbiting around the black hole, but your trajectory pointed you towards a black hole, well, you would fall in and then you would disappear and you would get crushed by the gravity. So uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to you anytime soon. Before we get to our next question, I'm just going to say we've had an inappropriate comment posted to the chat from Mrs. Tun's class. That is not okay. It will not be tolerated. If we cannot have appropriate comments from Mrs. Tun's class, then everyone from Mrs. Tun's class will be removed from this broadcast. I'm sure Mrs. Tun will take appropriate steps to make sure that this is not done again but I'm calling on every one of those students to use the chat appropriately. That behavior is not acceptable. Back to Mrs. Kowaleski's class. You have another question for us. We'll get you unmuted there. Okay, so this is Luke and he's asking Ruby's question. Is there any life on other planets? 
and how do you know if there is? Okay, um, is there life on other planets and how do we know if there is a life? And that's a really wonderful question as well. And uh, this, right now the answer is we don't know of um, life elsewhere um, in the universe. So um, the planet Earth is the only planet with a biosphere um, or uh, with a, and Earth is the only place that we know of where life exists. But astronomers and other space scientists are busily um, searching, trying to figure out if life um, has existed or does exist elsewhere. So we were just at Mars, and um, the, um, the rover um, currently on Mars, the Perseverance rover, um, is searching for evidence of life. Um, so it doesn't have the technology to find life, but it is um, creating um, samples to be picked up by a future mission that will bring those samples back to Earth and then scientists on Earth can then look for evidence of life, either past life or current life on Mars. Um, but um, so far, we haven't found any evidence of life elsewhere um, in our solar system or elsewhere in the universe, but it's something that astronomers are busily trying to do. And so there are several ways to do it. One is to um, do chemical analyses of samples, like um, what they're trying to do for um, Martian soil samples that will probably be brought back at the end of this um, decade. Another idea is to look for um, atmospheric signatures of life on other planets by sampling or looking at the light shining through their atmosphere. And, um, and for that, um, we need um, more advanced um, telescopes. And so the James Webb Space Telescope, which was just launched last month, and which is currently going, undergoing this unfurling process as it um, moves away from the Earth, um, it's thought that um, it will have um, some capability to, um, to sample the, um, to look at the atmospheres of other um, distant planets to look for evidence of life. It's a wonderful question. Those are great questions. Thank you so much for, from both of our classrooms for those excellent questions. And we've had a lot of questions in the chat. They've just, it's been a cascade of them, which I love questions. And so we're gonna try and get at some of the topics that I saw were brought up over and over and over again. One of the things I noticed a lot of people asked is how far they could travel as a human in space or have we traveled? And that sort of dovetails with the next question is if we have never traveled to other stars or other planets, how do we know what they are like and what they are made out of? Yeah, that's a um, great question. And um, so I, I jumped us back to the earth and I'm gonna pull away from the earth. And uh, remember um, when we were looking at the International Space Station, the International Space Station orbits actually really close to the Earth. It only orbits about um, 200 miles above the surface of the Earth. And um, so let's just jump back to that. Um, so you can see how close um, that is to the surface of the Earth. Um, and right now we're off the coast of California. And if we pull out, you can see how small the International Space Station is compared to the Earth as we disappear um, or as it disappears and we pull away. And if we keep pulling away, we'll also see the orbit of the moon. And the moon is basically the furthest that we've ever sent human beings. And the moon is about a quarter of a million miles away from the earth. And we haven't sent any people back to the moon in over 50, in about 50 years, but we do have plans to send astronauts uh, back to the moon in coming years. And so, if you look at the rest of the solar system, we haven't sent uh, people um, anywhere outside of that little tiny circle that is the moon's orbit. And so you can see how immense the solar system is, but we can learn a lot about the solar system through telescopes, like the ones we saw pictures of earlier, but we have also sent spacecraft out um, to visit the other planets. And so here you see trajectories for the um, Voyager spacecraft, which were launched in 1977. Um, and so if we pull out, you can see that these were launched um, 45 years ago. Um, and you can see dates attached to um, the different points on these spacecraft. And so you can tell that even now, in, you know, after the year 2020, these spacecraft are actually haven't traveled very far. So this gives you an idea of how vast space is, how much space there really is in space. and um, and uh, so there's still a lot of discoveries to be made, and hopefully some of those discoveries could be made by you in the future. 
Well, excellent. We are going to move on to another segment in our program. We have another poll question for you. And don't worry, there'll be another chance to ask questions in just a little bit. So hold on to those questions. Uh, and uh, well, here we go. Let's move on. Here is that poll question right there. So our next um, question is about where um, we will fly to outside of our solar system. So we can either go to our um, to visit our own galaxy, the Milky Way, or go visit another galaxy, a star nursery, which is a place where stars are born, or a star graveyard. All right, I'm seeing pretty even split so far between some of the options but we'll wait a few more seconds to let people weigh in. Now, uh, here's a question that I have for you, Kachin. None of us have ever been to the sun. How do we know that the sun is made out of hydrogen and helium? Yeah, that's a great question, Jose. Um, again, um, it um, turns out that you can use telescopes um, to figure out what things are made out of, even though you can't travel there and sample, you know, for instance, the gases of the sun. And um, so we can use telescopes to look at the light and um, the light coming from um, different chemicals, different elements in the sun have very specific signatures, almost yeah. like fingerprints. And with that right instrument, you can actually figure out what the composition of the sun is, even though the sun is 93 million miles away and we've never sent a spacecraft to plunge. Actually, we do have a spacecraft right now that's um, in orbit around the sun that um, is, um, can actually sample the, the um, solar wind uh, or the outer atmosphere of the sun, but we've never actually brought back a sample to Earth. Um, oh. so we can learn all about that remotely. All right. Well, we've got a lot of answers to our poll. It looks like we have a clear winner. And it looks like uh, the Star Graveyard has won with 64% of the vote. So thanks everyone for voting. And what I'm um, going to do is we're going to fly out of the solar system and visit an a, um, an object that lies several thousand light years away. And so here is an object known as the Crab Nebula. And let me center this on our screen. And this is a, uh, a supernova remnant, meaning this is a, um, and let me see if I can target this a little bit better. So this is um, what happened after a massive star. So this is a star greater than eight times the mass of our sun blew up at the end of its life. So after it ran out of fuel at the end of its life, it um, died via this enormous explosion um, and where it shot out, expelled its outer envelope. And then the remainder of the star collapsed into a remnant called a neutron star or a pulsar. So there's a um, kind of a dead star at the center of this cloud of expanding gas. And this um, gas is expanding at thousands of miles per second. And here's another picture of it. Um, both of these pictures are from, uh, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, so um, some stars um, end their lives in a very spectacular fashion. But then um, I, I think we have another picture of a dead star um, um, that we can show. And uh, this other picture is that of a planetary nebula. And st so stars like our sun um, will um, end their lives in a much more gentler fashion. So instead of exploding, um, dramatically and very violently, they more gently expel the outer envelopes of, um, of, of gases. And so these envelopes end up getting uh, pushed outwards into these uh, very fanciful and colorful patterns. And then you have a white dwarf star um, that, um, that left over at the end. But this is something that won't happen to the sun for another four or five billion years. So we have lots and lots of time to enjoy the heat and warmth of our sun. So don't that, sell the house. Um, I think yet. we're um, we're good to um, to hear from other schools. Is that right? Yes, Jorge? we are going to go back to our uh, classrooms that are joining us via webcam for more questions. Um, so we're going to go back to uh, Miss Tun's class. If you have more questions to ask, uh, Doctor Kuchu Yu. All right. Oh, what is my question? Go ahead. 
Go ahead, tell us your name, speak clearly, and ask your question. My name is Julia Maria. Um, what star is farthest? It's the farthest from us. Okay, you might have to repeat and um, step up closer to the mic because I couldn't hear you. What star is the farthest from us? What star is the furthest from us? Well, um, I'm not sure we can um, actually name a star that is furthest away. Let's uh, fly on out from our solar system. And even though um, I'm not sure how many votes our own Milky Way galaxy got, but we're going to um, take a look at our galaxy. So I'm going to fly us away. And so you can see all the stars starting to fly away from the sun. And now we're starting to see our Milky Way galaxy. So our galaxy is a huge collection of stars, hundreds of billions of stars. Um, we've never sent a space probe um, this far out, nor people, uh, but we've been able to uh, make a very educated guess about what the shape of our galaxy is. And the glow that you're seeing from our Milky Way galaxy is due to hundreds of billions of stars. And so from this distance, you actually can't see an individual star, but we do um, see the collective glow of those hundreds of billions of stars. So that, um, the reason why the glow is brightest at the center is because um, that's where the concentration of stars is greatest. It's at the center. And so you can imagine that there are stars um, throughout the Milky Way um, that um, could be visible um, to um, a very powerful telescope, um, but um, I won't be able to necessarily tell you um, which ones of those um, you know, um, or the name of any one of those. But uh, as far as the stars that are visible in the nighttime sky, we're gonna fly back to the sun. And here you can see a bunch of red lines. And these are actually um, the lines of the constellations that we, um, that I've turned on. And you can see that, um, so these are um, lines connecting visible stars in our nighttime sky. And uh, the furthest one of these stars is only a few thousand light years away from our sun. So you can see that the stars that we can see or make up a very small fraction of our Milky Way. Our Milky Way is enormous. And as we fly back, we'll see these constellation lines turn back to um, the constellations that um, we are familiar with here on uh, planet Earth. And so um, one of these stars um, is probably the most furthest that you can see, but unfortunately I can't um, off the top of my head tell you what, um, which one that, or the name of that one. But there are stars um, lots of stars out there, many of which are much further than you can see with the naked eye. Great question. That's a, that's a really great question. So, so many stars out there, lots of things to explore. Uh, thank you so much for that for those questions from Miss Tun's class. Miss Tun, do you have any other students that have questions? All right. All right, so a couple scientists uh, believe there's a planet nine. Do you guys think there's a possibility uh, that there's a planet nine in our solar system, apart from yes. Pluto? So, so that's a great question um, about planet nine. And uh, for a long time, you know, um, when I was growing up, we uh, thought of Pluto as being the ninth planet. Um, but um, as you might remember, Pluto, um, one of de um, Pluto's designations is um, is a dwarf planet. So here um, I've turned on Pluto's orbit, um, and um, and there is speculation by some scientists that there is a much um, bigger planet than Pluto. So Pluto turns out to be a very very small world. It's actually much smaller. It's smaller than our moon, and um, so you go from the terrestrial rocky planets like the Earth and Mars and Venus out to the gas and ice giants, which are much larger than the Earth. And then you go to Pluto, which is very small and very icy, um, but it um, turns out that there are a bunch of other objects out there that are um, similar to Pluto. And so here I've um, kind of turned on, um, you can very faintly see a band of objects called a Kuiper belt. And these are all icy small bodies like Pluto. And so Pluto turns out to be kind of the king of the Kuiper belt, um, but there's speculation that uh, based on the orbits of objects that we've um, seen so far in the Kuiper Belt, that there could be another uh, planet out there that's much more massive. It could actually be several times the mass of the Earth. Um, and there are astronomers that are um, very engaged right now trying to find 
that um, planet that they've called Planet Nine, but so far they haven't found um, they haven't found it yet. So the search continues, and whether this uh, Planet Nine really exists, we won't know until somebody actually finds it. But terrific question. Thank you for those questions from Ms. Tun's class. Ms. Uh, Kowaleski, I see you posted in the chat that your period is ending. So if you want to give us a wave goodbye as everybody filters out the door there. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. You had some excellent questions. Right. Well, so right. now we have a chance here in these last couple minutes to get to some of these questions that have uh, popped up in the chat. We have a lot of questions about stars. How do they form? Uh, where do they come from? Uh, and I see one question that keeps popping up over and over and over again, which is if we've never left the solar system, how do we know more solar systems are out there? Yeah, that's a, that's a terrific question. How do we know uh, about other solar systems? And again, um, it comes down to um, telescopes. And you know, you know, telescopes are an amazing invention. They've only been around for 400 years. So, uh, you know, unlike other technologies like fire or agriculture, which have been around for many thousands of years, but telescopes allow us to explore places that are so far away that we can never hope to visit them. And so let me see if I can turn on um, a visualization of um, other solar systems. So these weird um, colored um, kind of bluish jumping jack like things that are spinning or um, other stars that we know um, we have, um, we've discovered other planets around. So let's zoom out from the sun again. And uh, now we're gonna be um, flying around the stars in our local neighborhood. And you can see that there are hundreds of stars. Um, currently, um, this visualization shows about 300 um, solar systems or other solar systems out there. But right now we know of more than 4,000 planets around other stars. So um, that's an immense number. And um, other solar systems are definitely, you know, they're much further away than the other planets in our solar system. And, uh, but because planets um, are so much smaller than the, plan, uh, than the stars that they orbit, um, it's actually very, very difficult to, um, to find planets around other stars. Um, and um, in fact, it was so difficult that we, um, have only been finding planets around other stars in the last quarter of a century, over the last 25, 27 years. And astronomers have come up, have had, had to come up with very um, dif difficult techniques and very sensitive techniques to look for the signatures of stars, uh, or, uh, of signatures of planets in orbit around these stars by looking carefully at the, uh, the starlight. We won't have time to go into detail, uh, but um, these techniques have allowed them to discover more and more planets. So, you know, by the time, um, of, you know, later this year, um, I, I think um, we might hit 5,000 planets um, discovered and more and more are being discovered every day. That's a great um, question. All right. And then here, our final uh, sort of question. There's a lot of questions in the chat about aliens. Do you want to weigh in on aliens, Kachun? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, that's um, something that's really exciting. And, you know, people, Astronomers um, and science fiction writers have long wondered about where, whether there's life um, elsewhere in the universe and whether there's intelligent life, because you know, obviously there, um, it, it turns out that the most common life on Earth um, are, are bacteria, and some, uh, the very first life to appear on the Earth was bacterial life or microbial life, and that life actually existed for most of Earth's existence before more complicated life arose. And so that suggests, at least based on the single example, and remember, we only have one example of life in the entire universe, and that's from planet Earth, that suggests that bacterial life is really easy, or comparatively easy to arise, but um, more complicated life and perhaps intelligent life is harder to evolve. And so astronomers have come up with ways, um, I mentioned earlier that um, telescopes um, that are coming online now in the, in the future, might be sensitive enough to sample the atmosphere, the light passing through the atmospheres of distant planets. And if there is bacterial life on those other planets, we might be able to determine the existence of that life. Whether there is life that um, is intelligent, um, that's another question. And so um, right now there are astronomers 
We were searching for radio signals from other um, intelligences out there, uh, meaning intelligent life that have broadcast their existence via um, radio communications. And so far, we haven't found any. But if you think about it, you know, we are an intelligent species um, that is broadcasting our um, radio waves out into space. And I think I have a visualization of this if I can find it. But um, I may or may not be able to show this. Um, but um, so um, over the last um, 100 years ago, um, 90, 100 years, um, we've been sending out radio waves that are powerful enough to leave our solar system. And so you can imagine if there are aliens out there with radio telescopes, they might be hearing or um, learning about us through our radio and TV transmission. Oh. <laughs> There's some bad reruns they might get a might get a That's hold right. of. <laughs> well, we've got just a few minutes left. Do you have anything you want to close out by saying to uh, with saying to us, Kachu? Yeah, well, I um, want to thank everyone for joining in from across the country. I know uh, we had a lot of schools in Colorado, but also um, schools in California and Washington. So thanks for um, tuning in to this broadcast from Denver, Colorado. And as you've seen, um, you know, from our presentation today, there's an enormous amount of information that we've learned about the universe, even though, you know, for the most part, much of what we've learned has been uh, from telescopes here on Earth or in close Earth orbit. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to learn more about space, to learn more about astronomy. Uh, I encourage you to do so, whether uh, you do it at your school library or going onto the internet. There's an enormous um, amount to learn. And perhaps um, you um, too will become so interested that you become an astronomer and a space scientist in the future, and you can help contribute to our knowledge. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Katun, so much for that presentation. I learned a lot. Every time we work together, I learn something new. And once again, thank you all so much for joining us today for our Scientists in Action virtual tour through the universe. Thank you to our wonderful uh, uh, students who asked those amazing questions who joined us today. Thank you for posting your questions in the chat. I see a lot of curiosity out there. There were a lot of questions we weren't able to get to, so I would encourage you to do some research at places like nasa.gov. And of course, you can always reach out to the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for more information as well. Uh, we see some uh, some Big Dipper drawings being held up by Miss Tan up there as well. So if you, if you did that project, thank you so much. We hope it was very enlightening. And we thank you for joining us today. We do have another program coming up with our Scientists in Action in about a month. That is gonna be all about spiders. That is our uh, uh, ooh, amazing arachnid, sorry, I expanded my chat accidentally, amazing arachnid program on the 24th of February with our own Dr. Paula Cushing. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have a good rest of your day. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everyone.